I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. We uh, we've been talking about in the in between our podcast here. Uh, I guess because in the last podcast Zach brought up about fire. We were well, ta- the fire and the lack of enthusiasm, not enthusiasm, the lack of uh, discernment, excitement, and and, and yeah. e- excitement from the disciples. They're going around. They're sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> There's two people being transfigured that were dead years ago, or you know, in, a, in a. Which, by the way, so so we're glad you're bearing with us in Unashamed Nation because I think we spent four podcasts. We have camped out at the Transfiguration. Well, that's a place to camp out. It's at. a good place, though. Uh, it's a great. Study. This is a pivotal moment in in Luke, and this is leading to Jesus's trek to Jerusalem, where he's going to prove what he predicted. He said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna be killed," and and it, it's like every you'll notice because he does this three times in in most of the gospels where he, I mean, he references many times, but there's three distinct predictions: "I'm gonna suffer," "I'm gonna be," but every time it's like he uses different phrases to like you you get the picture of what's gonna happen. He's gonna go through the judicial system and be condemned to die, right? And so. Uh, you know the disciples are not not getting it, and I made the illustration that it's not uncommon, especially you know Christians have doubts, and I'm one who who says that's a positive thing. I mean, the Lord allows you to do that. The story we're fixed to read, you, this yeah. is exactly the picture that you see. Right, Jesus heals his son, and the dad he didn't. He was doubting whether he could even do it or not. Right, I mean, right. he handed it over, and Jesus wasn't saying, "Oh." I'm going to wait till you're sure 100% that I'm the one before I heal your son. But he didn't do that. He healed him. And then, then the father's like, well, help me with my unbelief. I'm still doubting. Right. And so we were talking about how we try to combat that as speakers. And I brought up something that happened that I will never forget. And we were kind of <laughs> laughing. This could be a new segment. It could be called... It could be called Illustrations Gone Wrong. <laughs> or, as Phil would say, this is a D-E-D. <laughs> Don't, Don't ever do. So there was a guy that I'm not, we're not going to mention his name just to, because we're fixed to throw him under the bus. But <laughs> He may be a listener now. That was a guy who was uh, went to the seminary with Al and I. He was an upperclassman, so I guess when we were freshmen, he was a junior. Yeah, he was. And, uh, and a great speaker and he was from uh, florida by the way zach yeah uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> oh, yeah. what gordon dasher was it so, <laughs> was my dad. No, it wasn't gordon it wasn't gordon. <laughs> so from time to time you know these these what they call preaching school students they would recruit to speak and even i who i said i'll never be a you know like a paid preacher in my mind when i went i was just trying to learn the bible well, we would all like practice preach on each other in chapel. We would, but but, but then every once in a while, you got an opportunity in the big room. Yeah, you would. You got caught up to the big leagues. The big yeah. leagues. It was just, it was like a call up. It's like double A. Yeah, and then maybe you got that one chance to shine. So, <laughs> this, so you really want to do it really good. And this is yeah. years ago, but uh, and a lot of these people, you know, it was hard to to make a living when you were going through school because they had it set up where you couldn't have a job and do the amount of work that was required. I mean, you went to school five days a week. Four of those days were eight hours. And then you had all this homework. The other day was four hours. The the fifth day. Yeah. Yeah. There was, so you, they had a support system where you would try to go get support from people to, you know, financially help you. And I was terrible with that. I couldn't ask, people for money so basically i you know i lived on just peanuts and <laughs> playing cards but so this guy I was a little bit better at asking for money jace that's why i lived a little better than you and i became a preacher yeah exactly <laughs> so this guy you know and you got to remember at that time when you're in school you're fired up you're hearing all this bible and you're you're like you know i'm fixed to shake this bunch up so he gets called to preach at the big room for for Cert, you know, the main worship service. And he was pretty well the best speaker of the upperclassmen, in my opinion. And the most mature. He was older and married. He was older than us. And so 
uh, he was just a very affable guy, and I think you're right. I think yeah. he got a shot. Down to earth, you know. So what he and he did, was actually interning for the church, too, so that's one of the reasons why yeah. he got an opportunity. So what he did as a side job was uh, he was a roofer. Roofer, which, yeah. Which I got into that, you know. And so, man. Which I, I somehow I missed that. You were talking about when Burley was on. I never knew you got into the roofing gig for I a while. I did that for two years. I really? mean, look, I learned. That's a I'm hard thankful, job. I'm thankful for it because – I just do think that that every young man needs to experience, you know, what real work is. I agree. And, uh, you know, it's difficult. It was a worldly environment sometimes, you know, because part of the crew, you know, they're just trying. It's hard to get somebody who will work on, you know. We could probably change our whole culture if we could reintroduce an apprentice mindset where every young man especially – would have to go and spend some time working for somebody. Oh, yeah. We could probably change our whole... Well, you probably don't know this also. I worked in construction, you know, major construction of buildings and all for three or four months. And I'm going to tell you, they hollered at me from the time I showed up to the time I left and used every four-letter word in between from the moment I got there to the time I left. You know, at least with the roof and Burley was had just come to the Lord and he was trying to get his life right. We were having a few <laughs> spiritual conversations. But uh, so anyway, the guy gets a, I don't remember the sermon because <laughs> it was years ago. Which let me just say off the bat, if you've got an illustration gone wrong, the one thing that will be common to that is nobody will ever remember what the sermon was about because yeah. the illustration has now trumped any message that you were trying to get across. But, but what this crazy boy did, I will never forget, and it was the number one memory I've had over any sermon because he was talking about the transfiguration and, you know, the the fire of the Holy Spirit and, well, you know, the problem with church gatherings is you're doing the same thing every week. And Al, you know this. Sometimes it, it's hard to get a pulse, yep. especially in your hometown. And this guy's full of, you know, vigor. And so he had a contraption, huge contraption, up on the podium. And he had, you know, like a like a black sheet over it. And so he unveils it. This is his... In, we're getting to the invitation thing here. So he's and built his whole lesson up to oh, this yeah. point. He's now he's going to bring it home. He brings bring out it a, home. You know something that the equivalent looked like a f- end of a fire hose, and he ignites this thing, <laughs> and it's a blowtorch about the size of a small vehicle. <laughs> it's a roofing torch to heat the roof, right? Yeah, yeah. And when he touched that thing off, look, I'm three quarters of the way. <laughs> In the back. <laughs> and this is a big room. <laughs> well, look, it was the equivalent to when the tongues of fire came and danced around. Because just he was the, the tongue. <laughs> look, <laughs> the wind, first of all, that hit me blew my head back. And the heat, my first thought was, I wonder if the people in the front row are still alive. <laughs> oh, no. you're, you're he, pretty so far he's back. The, so he, he's got the fire. He's pointed this at the direction of the audience. It's going over your head. <laughs> it it went the blow torch, which is amazing. <laughs> He's, you know, but they a, heat a whole roof, Zach. This machine heats a whole right. roof. This room is that's a big room. close to being on the front page of the newspaper tomorrow. Yeah. And I thought to myself. 45 different people were burned to death. After I had gathered myself. Church misfigure. And I'm sure multiple people needed to go to the bathroom. I mean, <laughs> it was one of those moments. But I thought this guy's oh. preaching career just ended right before That's my it. eyes. Because we broke every so fire the code. instructors oh. were running up there to, to kind of oh. quieten things oh, down. That, I'm guaranteeing How you. many meetings did he have to sit in that next week to talk about what a bad thing he had done? Well, oh, the only oh, people that responded on the alt- altar call were the elders. And it wasn't that they were responding. They were getting close enough to get him to say we need a meeting right now. <laughs> Don't fire up a blowtorch in the middle of the worship assembly. That was so powerful. I'm not embellishing. It just, the, the heat and the force of that thing, and I'm three quarters of the way back. How far am I from him? 
Oh, 70. that's well. That thing is probably fifty yards. I'm, I yeah. was fifty yards away. Can you imagine the people in the front row? What that felt like? I mean, he put it over your head. Yeah, I mean, people were diving for. <laughs> it was a shot. <laughs> <laughs> wow! And it like it it heated was up. Was he the... just getting louder as the machine? <laughs> Cranked up? Did he? Cranked? No, he didn't. He, he didn't he, remember anything about the sermon anymore. He didn't. You know, yeah, I don't remember. But it wasn't like that. It was just like a, a shock moment. <laughs> shock and uh, all. Of yeah. Then he made his point. No one was listening. I, I'm serious. It, it was. You too- want to transfigure someplace? Go do that. Well, right. But that's the thing. I mean, it's the, what people don't realize. Especially, I mean, young- God had him beaten. When the when the when the cloud came by and you know it was a big racket and he had him but but it was a, a replica that it was <laughs> now but preachers get to thinking like you start thinking wouldn't it be cool if and almost every time those thoughts begin and look I've had them you know at some point mm-hmm. when he before the sermon he got to looking around at all of his equipment saying ah uh-huh. yeah yeah that I thought about that later I thought they wanted you you know I'm going I'm going to get this much bill of fire under them Yeah well you're studying Since late he at, actually brought the fire yeah. you, you start you're studying late at night staring at the ceiling and you're like a blowtorch <laughs> I you want a fire You're going to bring the fire. fire I'm going to give you some fire So it was odd that we I tried to You want to transfigure the the real estate that part of the country we live in? Check this out. I'll show you about what fire. Well, I had one. I had one. Not not that bad, but but uh, I had one that went wrong. So we grew up out here on the river, and but in doing that, you just lived a certain lifestyle, and we didn't go to doctors, we didn't go to veterinarians, we didn't go anywhere to deal with anything. We dealt with everything ourselves. So if an animal needed euthanizing, we did it. I mean, that's just part of our lifestyle. Well, I thought everybody was like that. You know, you only have your own experiences, right? Yep. So I don't even, again, I don't remember the sermon. (laughs) I don't remember what I I was there. I remember. I don't remember the point I was trying to get across, but I used as an illustration when we had euthanized the dog here on the river. And I mean, I mean, it was a firestorm. Now in the moment, you don't realize it, but then afterwards, I got hammered by so many people in our church. It mostly just little ladies. Well, it upset people. It upset people. Everybody likes dogs, and they don't want to hear a preacher talking about one dying. That's right. That yeah. that's the rule. I it's mean, you exactly can add that, you know, to the list. Oh, it, I, it was a from that point a DED. Now I'm clever enough, and I still got to preach here. So the next week, I got up and I did a whole funny bit of my you know, falling on the sword. And I took pictures of me with this, one of our staff members, dogs, and we drank out of a bowl together. And I had all these pictures of where everybody's laughing. It's like, oh, Al, Al loves dogs. Yeah, Al loves dogs. He's good. So I was crafty at how I covered it. But it was, again, it was one of those deals where it was an illustration. In my case, I was just pretty ignorant of thinking how this would come across. Yep. But I mean, so when the illustration trumps the lesson and that's all anybody can talk about that means you, t- you used a bad illustration well in this case yeah. it was a safety issue i mean you know what what are you thinking <laughs> dude <laughs> you're <laughs> i but mean something will heat an entire roof do not unleash that onto a crowd of people but that's... you see where his thinking was it's like well what we're talking about is more important you know are you ready to die or whatever the illustration i, I don't I, I really do I not think remember that's what he meant. his point right, but he's just like, the fact that you pointed it at the, at the audience <laughs> That's the, I mean, if you had like a little flamethrower, I, I mean, I got to get that. You, you fire it up, you point it at the opposite direction, you know, but to point it over the heads of the audience, that's a little extreme. So I have to say, uh, we have, uh, through our years of doing the Unashamed podcast, uh, we've had a lot of folks that have sponsored the podcast uh, by letting us know about their products and we're always very appreciative of that. Um, that helps us be able to get this out to you uh, so you guys can, can listen and follow along with our Bible study. Sometimes you come, a company comes along uh, that's really good and really shares a lot of our values. And Barrel Buddy uh, is one of those companies. When Zach and I first uh, talked to these guys on the phone, the first thing they wanted to do was pray uh, before we talked about uh, them sponsoring the podcast. And so that got our attention right off the bat. 
uh, the more conversations we've had. They're great Christian guys. They have a small company that started just like our company did with really a need, uh, a hunting need, and they saw it and they went out and created a product to take care of it. And so that's their polymers that Jace has there in front of him. And basically, these white polymers will make sure your barrel is clean, fits any gauge, shotgun, fits any rifle, and any pistol. Um, and to make sure that uh, you've got a weapon uh, that's going to be safe, but also is going to be effective. So we want you to check these guys out. Great company. BarrelBuddy.com is where you go. B-A-R-R-E-L Buddy.com. The most unfortunate thing about this story, Jace, is I only wish that, because now we record everything on camera, is that we don't have that on camera. To oh, wow. <laughs> it could be one of the all-time You great could do ones. a reenactment, because I guarantee you, because there were a lot of you know older people there, I guarantee you that a lot of people either lost their toupee or grabbed the top of their head when that thing hit, <laughs> which when you think in the TV world, that's what they would do. The guys up there, watch this illustration. You know, shot to the audience. Whoop! I mean, toupee comes off. You know, people are sweating because it 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 raised the temperature in the room at least twenty degrees yeah. immediately. It was I just it was so intimidating. I, I just couldn't believe it. I thought, what was he thinking? Because <laughs> my instinct was to run. Oh, I thought, yeah. well, we're this this yeah, went you, terribly wrong. One mistake there, and you 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 got a big problem. But you know there are some what I I call them prop preachers. I've never really been one, but there are some that are very effective. They bring oh, yeah. props up on stage all the time and use yeah. those in practical ways, and are very good at it. Yeah, you know I never was a big prop guy, but I would try to engage stories or different things. I remember one time I did a it's just one that stuck in my mind that was a positive. Remember that song from Oh Brother, where out there I went down to the river to pray? Yeah. It's kind of yeah. a really beautiful yep. song, and they were coming to get baptized. And so I, that song, it just really touched me. Was, I guess it was about the time the movie came out. And I had an idea that at the end of my sermon, I was going to have our praise team people start that from the audience and then come forward, and they did it. And it was, I mean, it gave you chills. It was so good. Like the just them singing it, and as they came forward, the harmonies kept going, and they had their oh, yeah. mind. By the time they got up there and we were singing this song, I was ready to get baptized again myself, you know? Yeah. And every once in a while, you hit on one that works out well. Yeah, I think uh, Jeff That Walling. was the old brother where I thought. Yeah, yeah. The, Jeff I Walling, who's a good friend of ours, he, uh, he works out at uh, Pepperdine now, but he's always been – a dynamic speaker. He he usually speaks to one young, of the best I've ever heard. Yeah, young people, but he's really good at crowd interaction. But yeah. he's good at that, you know. Which, you know, part of my speech is when I go around, and because most of my things are maybe not church events or yeah. whatever. But I'm not scared to interact with people because at the end of the day, I'm just a normal guy. I'm, right. I, I'm not, I don't claim to be some kind of world class speaker because that's where all the fun comes out and it's authentic. Yeah. You, you involve other people. One thing he does that I like is instead of saying I got three points, he'll he'll pick people from the audience. Yeah. And I don't know how he does it when he goes to places that he doesn't know anybody, or he may ask for volunteers. So he strategically does a sermon where when he gets to that point, they say, or, or yeah, they stand up and say it. You know, but it's it's clever. It's like if most people tried that, it would be a complete disaster. Got to be good. But every time I've heard him do that or see that, it's so much more memorable than something like, you know, lighting a blowtorch over my head. I, <laughs> yeah. The lesson yeah. I learned there is stay away from that machine. Yes. Or, or stay in your lane, bro. <laughs> That's, the point is you want the illustration to to accentuate what you've talked about and to bring it home, not to become... 30 years later, the only thing you remember about a person in this case. Of things you don't want to ever do. That's right, exactly. During the sermon. Mm. Zach, so, have you ever had one go go wrong on you that you can I don't do, yeah, I don't do the props. I, I don't think I've ever done a yeah, prop in I'm a sermon. I'm not a prop so, Yeah, I just stay away from that. Yeah. Why don't we just say to get, Jesus? I mean, I think that's, that's even the better. key element in, you know, I was talking about, last podcast, all the arguments that we get into. So coming out of the transfiguration, where do you start, Jace, to kind of... Well, what you start is, right look, so so the perfect segue, Dad, 
so we're we're literally in the case of the transfiguration we're on a mountain and so now we're coming down from the mountain and before we even and I'm going to read this text but before I even read it there's so many illustrations to use our point that you could talk about that in other words when you've been on a mountain and then you come down into a valley there's a lot of implication yep. that goes with that statement and so I do think that part of what's happening here in this story that we're about to tell is the idea they had just experienced this amazing thing on the mountain, Jesus included. And now we come back down and we're back into real life. So let me read it and then we'll comment on it. Uh, Verse 37 of Luke nine is where we are. Um, If you're keeping score, we're moving on from the transfiguration. The next day when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. So we're back where we were. We're back to the large crowds again. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsion so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive him out, but they could not. Then when you read the Mark account of this, I think it's the Mark account, uh, you get even more detail on them not being able to do it. And it's an interesting read. We'll make a look at that later. So Jesus, and, and and this is just me. I'll throw this in now and we'll talk about it later. But it's this almost seems like a frustrated tone to me from Jesus, like not just in the moment, but kind of in general. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. I mean, it's not, it's, you know, uh, most of the miracles have kind of been very, this didn't sound very compassionate. It's like, oh, you people, bring him over here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they all were amazed at the greatness of God. While everyone was marveling at all that that he had done, He said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I am about to tell you. And now he goes back to what he told them before the mountain. The son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they uh, did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. In modern day, I've talked carefully for several years on people who deal with with individuals who act like this, Al. Yep. They're telling me, yeah, that's 2023. Yep. Talk to the person. She, she, they, they're there. They're observing the human race. This kind of conduct goes on today. Yeah. I'm just going to say that to let people know, well, this is so far into what you get in these medical uh, uh, uh medical situations in these hospitals and where there's people like this coming and going, it would surprise you. I was surprised on how many people are screaming when they hit the floor. And I mean, yeah. sometimes you got to, you know, I mean, you have got to cuff them somewhere or another to hold them, but, but, but it's not like a large police force. It's just people who deal with individuals and this is exactly what they do. Yeah. So well, and I'm, I don't know the end of the story on and the, the the true cure for it. We point people to Jesus. We try to, but but a lot of this goes on. Never doubt it until, including today. Well, you bring up a good point uh, because we know it was an evil spirit because Jesus cast him the evil spirit was. out. Right. Uh, a lot of people look at this passage in modern day and say, "Well, this kid just had epilepsy." You know, because it's descriptive of an epileptic, and they're like, "This is, you know." And you'll hear, then you'll hear a whole thing about, well, you know, in the ancient times they thought evil spirits were into everything, blah 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 blah. But that's not true for this story because the Son of God kicks the demon out. This now, kind of conduct, trust me when I tell you, I have researched this thoroughly and talked to individuals who deal with this particular in this field yeah. of study. It's it, it's tough. It's tough, tough. And but here's the other thing: Luke, who writes this book, is a physician. 
Now, I don't know what they knew about epilepsy in the first century, but I'm saying is if there had been a medical explanation, I'm sure a doctor would have told us. What the doctor said was it was an evil spirit, and Jesus cast it out. And if you look over into the um, Mark account, yeah, the disciples right. said, why couldn't we drive it out? And he said, well, this kind can only come out by prayer. Yeah. Because they've been trying, remember, to cast this demon out. We're unable to do it. So, yeah. and, and the conversation is more, you know, when he says, how long, Jesus in Mark's account in 921, he said, how long has he been like this? And the answer was from childhood. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him, but if you can do anything, take pity. And Jesus is like, if you can, <laughs> question mark, if you can. <laughs> if you can. And then he says, you know, a very famous phrase that has been on many a sign outside a church building, everything is possible for him who believes. Which is, what's ironic is this guy, that was his problem, is he didn't believe, because immediately the boy's father said well i do believe but help me overcome my unbelief (laughs) which again a strange statement but but what a statement let's take another break so that's why i said it's an important point because i personally think that after the mountaintop experience with the transfiguration and the speech about when he said you know, I'm going to die, be buried, I'm going to suffer. But then he also says that if anyone would come after me, when he told his disciples, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. So it seems to be after the they come down off the mountain, they then experience from the disciples' perspective, which Luke really captures, look, there's going to be doubts. You're going to have difficulty battling with evil because the first thing that happens is this. And the reason I'm saying this is because then the next thing happened is this argument breaks out about who's going to be the greatest. And Jesus uses this example of a child. He says, you know, here's the the greatest in the kingdom who for he who is, uh, what does it say? Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, which I realize I'm jumping ahead, but I feel like I have to because I think his point was, you think, why is he using a child for an illustration here? Well, it takes a lot. When you welcome a child, that happens to be something I've been doing for the last two years, a child that's not my own, that in the course of ministry, we have gotten a child that we're helping care for. You know, kind of like our role at this time is kind of like, I guess, uh, you know, like like a godfather, but like a great, like like grandparents mm-hmm. from a godfather type angle, I guess. So we're trying to help the mom, trying to help the kid. But what I've learned in the last two years, there's an incredible amount of sacrifice that goes in to welcoming a child, especially from my wife. And just uh, take that, what you're just saying, take that and remember in various parts of a uh, couple of cities not very big monroe west monroe don't ever doubt it for a second that there's not now that they have the medical profession mental illness so and and you 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 look at our culture and and there's more and more of them you say but there is a lot you got a lot of drugs in there going back and forth you never know but mental illness is a thing going in progress all yeah. around us and it is nothing to laugh at at all I well mean, this is something you're difficult we, we have to deal with as to solve with jesus when you're helping people so you look there's gonna be a lot of doubts you're gonna be battling uh evil you're gonna be battling people's mental illness you're you're gonna have to sacrifice i mean there's no other explanation in my opinion on why he's giving them this illustration on the kingdom I'm representing is not about who's the greatest. It's about sacrifice. Yes. So that's why he's bringing the kid. If you're going to welcome him. Very much so. Well, then the next thing, well, you're going to have opposition. They go to the Samaritans, and that's where the fireball conversation came up. Mm -hmm. But the point was, people are not going to like you. They're going to oppose you. They're going to reject you. Well, then the last section, he gets into the cost. And all these things are, are good things. 
that it's going to cost you. It's you may not have a place to lay your head. Uh, you know, people are going to die in your family. You know, this is and, and they're they're not going to be welcoming you and what you have to say about. And then he's like, your family, people in your family is going to get upset about this road. Yeah. So that seems to be what how Luke has arranged these stories of Jesus. Right. It comes back kind of to the response of, yeah, I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to be raised. Then if you come after me, you're going to not deny yourself and take up your cross daily. So I don't know what y'all think about that, but that's that's kind of the way I understood it, which it helped me understand why it's making such a big deal about this guy having doubts. And, and when you look at the story itself, you realize how helpless he was, number one. It wasn't because he was some holy stalwart in the faith. Yeah. He's just a guy hollering out saying, look, he's desperate, yeah. which are the kind of people that Jesus is seeking. Yeah. So he stopped. Hey, then and now, I mean, if you talk to people who are there and who work in this field, and then when you talk to them and they tell you cases and what they've heard and they what they've seen, it's a, it's a scary thing, boys. I'll yeah. tell you all that. No doubt. Very much so. But then the second thing he uh, you see in this story that's weird is that actually when Jesus got involved, it seemingly got worse. You know, at first he was just convulsing, but then it says, uh, is it in Mark's account? It's in Mark's or, account. Yeah, in Mark's account, he he went from having a convulsion to being dead. This is uh, 25 of Mark 9. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit, you deaf and mute spirit. He said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. Well, think about this from the father's perspective. You wanted help, and now he's gone from being sick to dead. In the moment, you know that's what he was thinking. Right. And I think this was a great illustration for his disciples that Jesus was showing that I mean, you just know in the Christian faith, sometimes th th things seem to get worse after mountaintop experiences. That's right. You know? Which so, I think that in plays these modern that. times, you you can get some personnel if you want to research it. I'll spend my, uh, and you know, being a doctor, I'll I'll specialize in this particular field, the mentally ill or whatever. But you look into this and you open this box up. I'm telling you. It's a big, big opening, and it runs deep, and a lot of well, people. Here's, here's where I think people, I want to address that, Dad, because I think pe the if, mistake. If someone says this is not going on today, they don't know what they're so talking here's about. The mistake. Oh, but this is a different, I mean, Jesus was showing that he was the son of God and that he has yep. the power over it. What we're dealing with today, you know. But I think to Dad's point, I, I want to speak to that because because a lot of what I read about this was what just where you're at now. Well, they just didn't know. They didn't have the medical training. They didn't have blah blah blah. Yeah. But they here's the problem they make. Here's the problem they make. So they try to make it either or. In other words, it's got to be demon possession or this kid was an epileptic or this this person had mental illness. Yep. What what. What about both and? You could still be mentally ill. This kid could have been an epileptic, but the, he had a demon that then triggered the epilepsy every time he would have the fit. He, he was also deaf and mute, apparently, because that's what Jesus called it, a deaf it's and mute. It's coming spirit. from somewhere. So my point is, when we talk about mental health, which is a good subject to talk about, or we talk about emotional distress, they're almost always tied into spiritual they are answers as well. We they know are. that. I mean, that again, if a psychiatrist, my needs own somebody, help in this area for, with my fellow human populations. I mean, I see this so much along with the people who work in the nursing, the doctoral field, and when people just come, and, and sometimes the police have them and they're handcuffed and they, they have to cuff them. To, they'll tear up the place and. I mean, look, there's a lot of, I can't, way more than I ever thought. So my point is, not everybody that suffers 
with the mental illness or with some seizures or something necessarily has an evil spirit. Some of them could have an evil spirit that then triggers that. And I mean, because certainly that ha- is what happened in this case. Sure. So I, I just think we limit ourselves when we make it either or. It's got to be mental illness or or demon possession as opposed to potentially both, which is, I think, maybe what was going on here. Joe Bean, when he was on our podcast, he mentioned that demons, apparently, from the times you read about them in these scriptures and evil spirits, he mentioned that they tend to want to harm the body that they possess. And and that we see that over and over again. Oh, yeah. words, but then again, they're they're almost like they have to be there to have Look, an existence. A lot of them are doing this. The cutting and the and the hurting of yourself. Right. So it does bring it is an interesting discussion to see. But Jace's overriding point is is the one you want to really light, latch on to here, and that is that Christ is enough no matter what. And it takes that yeah. belief to make that happen. So And you're not gonna understand that all the time. Right. Now, that's obviously, exactly right. They mm-hmm. obviously, and you don't have to. I mean, look, I've had more of these conversations in the past three months with people, and you're like, "What could I say?" Because you know, just some people have become so calloused and hard-hearted, you be and bad. you're sitting there talking to them, and it's like everything you say they claim to already know, but when you say, "Well, how's that working for you?" You know, their life is in complete disarray and disaster I'm and when, so when you try to help them they're like well yeah we already know that you you almost want these doubts so you can have a point of reference to actually have a discussion so that's why i was zeroing in on the helplessness i think it was a double meaning the father was showing that he's helpless and desperate the disciples are acting like they got it all figured out and they didn't even pray i, I would just think all right, what should I do in any situation? Especially that that seems confusing. Is this mental illness? Is it a demon? Or well, the first thing we need to do is pray. But the fact that they didn't do that, and Jesus said this this is type only comes out in prayer. Now maybe I'm reading too much into this, but it just seems like it's such a crazy thing to say. This, He's I mean, saying it's more serious than you people are thinking. Well, or or maybe well, Jace I was thinking, why didn't you pray about that? But maybe it's come there. Remember, they're coming off. Of, he just sent them out not long ago, and they were able to cast out demons yeah. and heal people. And so you're feeling a little bit full of them and vinegar, you know, like I got this. And you're right; they forgot the the most important rule of being in Jesus' discipleship program is that you have to appeal to him and to the Father to do what you're trying to do. You're helpless. You're this helpless. Is all, it's not about this you. This is my power. You're denying yourself. You're ta- that is, to me, the point because he then— Well, you know it is because of the other illustrations the after. Next paragraph. That's exactly well, right. Then it, then it, that's why when you read the last paragraph, which a lot of Christians, make, it makes them uncomfortable, but— He's simply saying, this, this is going to cost you. This is not going to be all, you know, worship moments and, and blue skies and rainbows of being a disciple of Jesus, which goes back to the original thing of carrying your cross. Whatever you figure out that to mean is very important. Yeah. Because if you're carrying your cross daily, we all know what Jesus, what that meant to him. Yeah. When he was carrying his cross. He was alone. Nobody was encouraging him. They were cursing him. They were spitting at him. They were they had just flogged him. They were making fun of him. Well, are you prepared to go public for Jesus and experience the same thing? Ironically, uh, in in uh, chapter nine, about verse oh thirty four, verse forty six. Uh, they want to know about who's the greatest. Then he said, you know, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, for he's the least among you all. He's the greatest. He who is least among you, he's the greatest. Master, they said, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. He wasn't with our little group, so... We, we, we're we going to chastise him because he doesn't have it all fixed up. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. 
it's a pretty good answer for someone that thinks they've got a little bit more spiritual power mm -hmm. than the one seated next to them or the one they see on the side of the road. And you just automatically say, he's not one of us, call him because we're this. And then they've, and Jesus said, don't do that. Well, if we I just mean, applied this verse to our churches, it would be a lot better place. Oh my yeah, it would. <laughs> well, and just, and just think about it. I see somebody driving out demons out. You know what I'm gonna do? Not, I'm gonna leave them alone. I'm gonna say, hmm. You know, but but. But if they say, well, well, you, well, I've never seen that before. Well, I'll just be short to the point here. I have. But I've just think it. about the. Yeah, but it's not about driving out demons. You're helping people. Look, yeah. when you try to help people. Yeah. Which is a unselfish act, especially when you're doing Loving it. Loving them will go a long way. Well, especially when you're doing it in the name of Jesus. Because, look, there's people that help people all over the world. That's right. For us, you know, we're doing it in the name of Jesus from a humble, helpless position, trying to get them to see his power. Kind of like the, the, you know, what we said, the illustration about Jesus radiating from the Second Corinthians 3, that we're reflecting God's light and power on to people. It's Jesus. We're just it's just bouncing off of us going in to them is what we're trying to do. It's just amazing to me and we've talked about this before on the podcast. Something'll happen in our country and maybe some people say, Oh, is this a spiritual revival? And some you hear about somebody doing something great. Why is it that some people immediately want to do just what the disciples did and say, We we somebody needs to shut that down because this isn't the, they're not doing this the right way. And then they'll start telling you all the things they saw or heard they don't agree with. Why is that mindset there? Because Jesus makes it really clear here. It's not up to us to go around being the police of everybody's that's right. renewals and that's right. stuff that's happening out there. Yeah. That's, that's not our job. I mean, we're not qualified <laughs> is what I get out of this. Oh, I, I remember uh, just, you know, recently when this, this big thing with uh, Hillsong happened, with the, the leader, the founding member was under investigation for mm -hmm. child abuse or whatever. Well, he's, he's dead now. I mean, we're going back 30, 40 years, and their model with the money. And there's been multiple, uh, you know, shows about it, documentary, because the world, you know, when they hear something about a church being corrupt, well, that they're fixed to make a show about that yep. because it— kind of feeds their narrative on one of the reasons everybody's that, a hypocrite they're just well like, right yeah. everybody's you know a hypocrite and, and all but so somebody came to me about that because i i i even to this day you know listen to some of those worship songs and uh and i was trying to make the point kind of in the vein of what we just read don't ever doubt when jesus is is preached even amongst things like that that are going on, which look, I hate to tell you this, is going on in all churches. There are people in the pews that are living in adulterous relationships and all this. I mean, the church is filled with hypocritical people. I Sinners. think we all agree. If they came to our church and did a documentary on the hypocritical nature and go back 40 years, look, I'm pretty sure they can make a show out of it. Oh, yeah. it people yeah. come in yeah. there. We got a show. So the point I was making is I brought up this song and I said, well, I'll tell you this, because I was having an argument with this person. And I, I was trying to say, look, we can't police. God didn't call us to police all the religions of the world. I said, but that there's a song called So Will I. It's a famous song. I mean, I, I have it as top five songs ever created. It, it is awesome. It is the gospel. It ends with, uh, you know, speaking of Jesus, he's the one that leaves no one behind, which is a great line. I know where they got that, you know, Luke 15. But I just made a point to say, look, you got to remember the kingdom of God and, and speaking of on earth, spirit-filled people that are part of the church. Luke 17, 20, which we'll get to, says you can't see it visibly. It is within a lot of religious settings and a lot of settings that, that are dark as far as false apostles and immorality going on and but jesus is still being preached in ver in a variety of ways and people are coming to the lord they, they are they are finding this and so you got to make up your mind to remember the big picture and that song i use it as a classic example don't listen to the song just go look at the words 
Just look at all the words that somebody wrote in the middle of that ministry and tell me that was not a positive thing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, yeah, because if, if you hold people to a standard that, okay, you've got to be 100% right before we will listen to your song or your your sermon or read your book or whatever. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't get that either. I mean, I'm like, look, what, what does the song say? Is the song biblical? Is it, I mean, I don't, I mean, we, we, no one's got it on straight. We, you know, we come in here and talk about the Bible every, almost every day of the week. And we say all the time, we could be wrong. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's exactly like, hey, it's, like what's the, the, old, the old football ad. It's do your job. <laughs> Yeah. Well, what I'm Your saying job. is if you go to YouTube and you look at a Hillsong song, well, right under yeah. it's going to be some preacher saying wh- how, why they're demon-possessed, and then right under that is going to be a show that Hollywood did saying that it that it's wrong. And, and I'm like, this is not the model when you read wh- wh- who Jesus is and what he did. Because even in his own disciples, there were people— or at least one person, doing miraculous gifts that Jesus had given, Judas, and he was a million miles away from Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yep. Did that and got not worse. thwart everything he did? No. One of them was a betrayer, which is the reason I think he chose him. Because when you see all the churches and all, they're going to be ones that have leadership go completely off the rails and follow money or the world or whatever. We, we all know that happens. I mean, there's... Yep. Especially when it comes to this kind of idea with the prosperity, wherever that came from, which you think it's not unlike what Paul wrote Timothy. I mean, right after he gives this great illustration, or not illustration, but great uh, pontification on who God is and what Jesus represents, the King of Kings, it was right after he said money is the root of all evil and watch out for false yeah. You know, prophets among you who elevate money before Jesus. Well, it's still going on today, but that doesn't mean we're going to have to go run an investigation. Do you realize how many churches there are out there? Oh my goodness! You know, which you, I mean, you, you think you want to, you want you want to steal, steal your joy if if your job is to expose the hypocrisy in the church, and that's where you put all your effort, as opposed to make God famous and and celebrate his glory i mean that that's that's the two that that's kind of the litmus test for me like are we talking more about who god is or are we talking about more about who the church is and, and how messed up the church? i mean church is messed up i mean i mean no matter what church you've ever been to that's right you, i mean you, you see how the sausage is made it's not it's not yeah it's not quite as um yeah it's it's a it's 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 hard i mean you're trying to run i mean trying to run an organization that's got a lot of issues and got personality uh, differences and things going on. Not to say there is a true, I mean, there is true uh, stuff in the church that needs to be exposed. I just think that we're in a culture right now that it's like, we just cannot wait to expose failure in the church so that we can discount it. And I, I just don't think that's healthy. I, I think just think there's a, where, God is. where I am is after being, you know, in a church and basically working there for most of my life. Now that I'm not doing that, as is is my primary focus my my vision has broadened to who the true enemy is and what he's doing to our world and our culture and people and so i i'm kind of like jesus here i want to focus more on fighting the true enemy the ones who aren't yeah. against us meaning that don't believe that exactly. jesus is who he is well, and, and let's just fight that battle and not, no, not so much with the guy across the street. No, you know? no doubt. I think that's why he's showing these illustrations. This is part of the kingdom is existence. It's it's frustrating to run across groups of people where you're like, they're not doing this exactly right. And you have this moment happen here, and Jesus says, hey, if they're not against us, they're for us. Let's keep moving. I mean, we, we know what's right because, you know, even at our church, when I said you could run an investigation, but one thing I do know is when sin comes out, it's confronted. It's yep. de- there's so many private room meetings going on on a daily basis. Yep. Of very, and I'm a, I'm not, I don't even have a position in the church, mm-hmm. and I just have people, you know, that I've known for years. They knock on my door, and they come in and turn themselves in and say, I've been doing this or that. Or, so you're like, well, what do you do? You try to help them. You go back to the same things that we're talking about here, and you know you encourage them to confess their sins. And but and people are like, well, if you confess it, well, then everybody's going to know that they've been living a hypocritical life. 
Yep, that's the hand we're dealt. That's what God said. That's how we deal with it. I mean, it goes back to what he was saying. All things are... They're cranking up a movie where it's about me, and it's the most pathetic thing you've ever seen in your life. But if you want to see a pathetic individual on the big screen, (laughs) it's coming up. The blind. Yeah, just cl- yeah, clarification. The movie's not pathetic. <laughs> the movie's great. The, the lifestyle is great. Woo, but, 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 Phil, but there is redemption. That, I, I said, man, that's downright embarrassing. But, but, Phil, you're right. If everybody shared every rotten thing they did, you know, and, and made a movie about it, well, nobody wants to see that. But but that's how we operate in view of the cross yeah. and, and our helplessness and our humility and showing the power of God. I mean, let's face it. This is a newsflash. The church is a group of flawed people. No doubt. They're hypocritical in nature. You're not no a hypocrite if you admit it. And the, the thing about it is. Once you admit it. Once you admit it, then you're out there. Because, the, yeah. Dad, I would argue that the reason that you allowed us to make a movie about your sinful life before you turn to Christ, you're still a sinner. But the fact of how it drove you to Jesus Christ proves the point that you're willing to talk about what God did in your life. That means you're not a hypocrite. The you are not a hypocrite. The underlying thing that hit my head was, uh, it was, it was a question, will, will it win people for Jesus? That's right. Will, will, will it help yeah. them? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote a big yes on that. So we'll, uh, that's theblindmovie.com. I'll play Zach's role because we're out of time. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in overtime, uh, this idea about the cost, because we just touched on a little bit. So if you want to follow us over, blazetv.com slash unashamed. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube, and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.